Hey, everybody. Welcome to Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. <laughs> All right. So you can see we got a full house here for a little bit. I'm Lakina McGee. You can follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter and at Keena underscore McGee on the Insta. I'm Sid the Kid. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at SidKid80. Once again, at SidKid80. That's S I D K I D A zero. That's S I D K I D A zero. And let's welcome back the third member of our crew, Mr. Jason Pfeiffer. Yay! Nice to Hello. Be back, man. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be back. They can follow me at Truth and Reason underscore on the Twitter. You can also follow the show's Twitter handle, even though I haven't been on it in a while. It still exists. It is at 2NDCSCHI. So follow it. All right. We're proud to be joined by a friend, a good friend of the program. You can listen to him on 670 to score. He also does sideline reporting for the Chicago Bears. He's also a podcaster. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You can follow him at Mark Grody Sports on Twitter. He is Mark Grody. Mark, how are you? Great. Good to be with all of you guys. Jason, uh, welcome back. My only question is, Jason, where you been? Where, what happened? What's, what's going on? Where was the breakdown? What happened? Well, well, no, just life, really, Mark, really. Okay. <laughs> no breakdown, right. really. Just been on, a, just been on a, a little life trip here. I'm doing, I'm doing some other things. I'm still got okay. another podcast going, but uh, just finally getting my schedule back here on a little bit of consistency. So, uh, so I'm back, hopefully, to stay here for a little bit. Awesome. All right. So, Mark, uh, there have been a lot of stuff going on with the NFL and, you know, this whole, like, we were talking about for the last few weeks, Sid and I, about the unprecedented offseason. So, what are you expecting from, because training camp's supposed to start next week, but there have been a lot of things that have been going on. What do you think about all this stuff that has transpired these last few weeks? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing in that they, the NFL, as of as we speak right now, they do plan to go ahead with that blueprint rough draft date of July 28th for the majority of the NFL teams reporting to their respective camps, which would, of course, include your Chicago Bears in Lake Forest. But obviously, the players still have a ton of concerns in terms of what the plan is, in terms of feeling safe and it would appear being that many of the biggest names in the game have spoken out and clearly don't feel completely safe about it that there may be some holdback some pushback some opting out we don't know about that as of yet but it's clear the players are walking this fine line of get it right but you know they're hashtagging it we want to play so they're making it clear that they don't want to have to do anything drastic in terms of not showing up or not being there or not playing. Uh, but they, they want, they clearly need and want some more assurances. And then as far as like what camp would actually look like, that, that's my big question is even when and if there is camp, what will they be allowed to do and not be allowed to do moreover? Because it's going to be way different than anything we've ever seen. I can't imagine that there'd be any kind of real contact in camp. We had yep. Dion Miller on our podcast a few weeks ago, and I asked her that she uh, received a memo from the NFL or from the Bears or from from ABC7 how the media was going to co uh, cover training camp, and she said no. I asked you the same question, Mark, since you're closer. You're actually on the sidelines during the games. Have the Bears or the NFL sent you a memo on how the training camp is going to get covered for 2020? Well, I mean, I have kind of a rough draft idea. Okay, first of all, I'll say this, Cindy. I, I don't know what – if I am going to be allowed on the sidelines reporting home or away. Maybe I'm the only person that travels and is allowed on the sideline. I don't know. That is definitely something that I'm going to have to wait for, and I'm sure that the, the NFL – the Bears, I'm guessing nobody knows that yet in terms of who will actually be allowed to be on the field. As far as how it will be covered once we get started with training camp, uh, my guess is, I don't know this for sure, the guess is that there, there will be just a few people, a few reporters allowed to be there in Lake Forest on the practice fields covering it. And then they would be what we call pool reporters and they would report back to the rest of us. So there's going to be limited access, probably going to have to get used to sitting where I am right now on my couch um, and participating in, uh, in Zoom calls with whomever they allow us to talk to, whether it's Matt Nagy or a couple of players, sort of like the way the OTAs were handled, the off team uh, practices or the, um, the off-season practices, I should say, where they would let us talk to, you know, Matt Nagy and then maybe a handful of players throughout the week. So it's probably going to be a very similar format to the one that we are all on right now. 
Hey, Mark. So um, the NFL did release a, a few mandates, something to sort of get their sort of outlines of plans started a few days ago. Um, I guess it's sort of a two-parter here. Give us to react your reaction to that because it's it's basically a lot of uh, social distance, distancing mandates, you know, um, you know, sitting in between seats, um, you know, half capacity on team buses, stuff like that. Can you just give us your thoughts on that? And do you think that will actually work? Because it's not like other leagues where they can technically have a bubble or anything like that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I know that, um, you know, they have the the rule where you can't, after, after games, you can't do the, the big jersey exchange. So they are, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> and so they're they're eliminating and tweaking where they can. Um, you know, it's it, all, all the things that they they spelled out. They are the right things to do. What what we don't know is that once there is full force contact during a game, how that will affect things. Do do the cases spike? I mean, there are going to be cases of of the virus throughout the season. It's a matter of how many there are. Um, and if you can manage it, um, then you're going to be in good shape. But, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, they could, they could have all the protocols they want, all the rules and regulations they want. But once the games actually start and there is contact on every single play, as we all know there is in the NFL, then, then what? So, you know, will, and then to your question, will this work? I mean, I hope it does. But, I mean, like just, just doing the – the physics and the math of it and the logic of it, it is the sport least likely to work. So, you know, it's, I hate to give the answer. We'll see, but we'll see. Now, Mark, what do you think, do you think that the Bears have any type of advantage with all this and unprecedented that's been happening? Cause they haven't been able to work out with new quarterback, Nick Foles and some, I don't know if they've been doing like workouts sort of like privately, but do you think the Bears have an advantage here? I think they're more probably in, in this particular year, honestly, Lakina, they're probably more at a disadvantage because they do have competitions that they need to have play out, which are not going to play out in a traditional sense. They need to see what Nick Foles looks like when he actually gets a chance to work with the wide receivers and those that will catch the football for the Bears this year. That time is going to be limited. They are going to get cheated on that. Um, there's so much they need to see in terms like like all the – and this goes for all the NFL teams. The rookies are all going to get um, compromised because, you know, uh, how how much can they learn in a compromised off season? So I think one advantage that the Bears probably do have in terms of what we've seen from Matt Nagy, you could say what you want about him, but he is a very creative coach. So he has learned to make the most of many situations. So his creativity may help out, but just in general, the way the Bears are made up and the things that they need to work out and the competitions that they need to see play out, I think that they're at a, at a disadvantage in this particular year because of that. I want to stay with the Bears' office for a minute, Mark. Allen Robinson, he's been nothing but productive ever since he's been here. He's going into his third year in a Bears uniform. The first year, two years ago, when they made it to the playoffs, he was still recovering from that torn ACL, but he came up big, toward, especially towards the end of that season. Last year, he got over 1,000 yards. And me, me and people thought that he should have uh, went to the Pro Bowl, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Going into uh, his last year of his contract, what do you expect out of him for year number three? Do you think the Bears will extend him at some point? I think they will. Yeah, I think that that, that would be the plan to eventually extend his contract. Um, you know, he, he's earned it. And at this point – he is the only proven thing you have on that offense, and you can't afford to not extend him. Um, I expect a similar year this year to what he did last year to, um, you know, catch over a thousand yards worth of footballs. But I also hope that there that he has more help that Anthony Miller can get to the next level that Tariq Cohen becomes a bigger part of the receiving game again, like he was in 2018, that maybe we see something more out of Javon Wims that we see development in Riley Ridley. Um, you know, obviously you'd like to see contributions from the tight end, which is such an important position in this offense, but I can just keep naming guys. The point is, is Allen Robinson cannot do it by himself. 
he's still going to be expected to be the top guy in terms of those who catch the football for the Bears. Uh, but but the guy needs help. But yeah, I mean, to answer your initial question, I expect a 10 out of Allen Robinson again this year. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, Mark. And uh, you you said a name that I was going to go to next. And um, we've seen flashes from this guy, right, from the past few seasons. I'm talking about Anthony Miller, of course. Um, I, I But I would think the key, you know, word here, the key for him in general and period is consistency, right? Wouldn't you say so? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Jason, I think consistency, I think staying within the offense, which he has struggled to do, um, taking practice seriously, knowing the playbook. These are all things that they have been on Anthony Miller to do because um, the thing is, is he got away with a lot of that kind of stuff when he played at Memphis where he was terrific, but he was able to get away with improvising and being an athlete and being the guest, best guy on the field. That's just not the case anymore. This is the NFL, and things got to be a little different. So, I mean, they talked about it too this offseason. They talked about – a like really really pinpointing him to have a structured off season knowing what he is doing every day knowing what he is studying every day and then be ready when camp arrives and the preseason and the regular season so he can do what he did a lot of his rookie year what he did a lot of the second half of last year and not have those long gaps of inconsistency that have kind of dogged him throughout the first two years of his career so we could all see it I mean Physically, he, he, he's probably the most talented guy in that wide receiver's room in terms of pure strength and speed. And ultimately, if he could figure it out, route running ability, he's got it all. He's ferocious when he runs with the ball. He's got it all. Now it's just a matter of accepting that he has to fit into a, a system at this point as opposed to kind of doing his own thing out there. A few more minutes with 670 to score and Bears sideline reporter Mark Grody. Now, Mark, uh, let's talk about defense for a second. They brought in Robert Quinn. I think that was a good move. Akeem Hicks, you know, injuries last year. Do you think they're capable of being back to that top 10, top 5 level, level that they were a few years ago? I think they are. And, um, I, and, and part of it probably is in my head that they have to be. Um, just because, again, it all goes back to the offense and how much time do they have to actually get better. And when the Bears defense was elite two years ago, they were able to get 12 wins out of it. But, yeah, I, to answer the question, I do think that when you bring back – I mean, we all saw how important Akeem Hicks was last year. You get him back. Um, Robert Quinn, as you mentioned, he is a guy that can actually get to the quarterback. Leonard Floyd just was not a guy who was good at doing that. Khalil Mack needs help. I mean, he was quadruple teamed. Everybody was getting a piece of him last year, chipping and just just knocking him around. Um, he needs help. I also think that a full, hopefully, a full healthy year of Danny Trevathan, a full healthy year of Roquan Smith, um, the development hopefully of Jalen Johnson, um, and having you know um, Eddie Jackson hopefully moving back to a more free safety spot where he can feel free to do his own improvising and to intercept the ball and do what he does as opposed to last year. So there's many things that indicate the Bears will be in position to get back to being an elite defense, yes. Let's focus in on the running game, Mark. Uh, David Montgomery now going into year two out of Iowa State. Uh, head coach Matt Nagy was shamed by the media and, cer and certain experts to uh, use David Montgomery in running the ball, especially after that injury, shoulder injury to Mitchell Trubisky, the quarterback. Uh, what do you expect out of David Montgomery in year two because even though the offensive line uh, struggled a year ago, he still ran a close to a thousand yards for an entire season. What do you expect out of Mr. Montgomery in year two? Yeah, I definitely expect a jump for him. I don't know if I'm going to place like astronomical numbers on him because we just don't know. We just don't know. I mean, based on what he did at Iowa State, he was terrific. As you said correctly, you know, even with uh, a struggling offensive line, he was able to do what he was able to do. But we just didn't see enough from David Montgomery. The, the actual volume wasn't there because the running game was not used, as we know, for about half of the year in terms of the way you would hope it would be used. So it's hard to – it's really hard to evaluate and know just how good David Montgomery is. Um, they uh, – uh, you know, the Zoom calls that I've been on with David Montgomery, with the Bears offensive coaches, they all say to a man, 
that, yeah, there you will see a jump from David Montgomery. I know from talking to Montgomery one-on-one -on -one at the end of last year, he is earnest and his desire, like he hated the year that he had last year. It, it pissed him off that he was not better. And he, fe he felt like he let the fans down, the organization down, like, and you hate to hear a guy talking like that because you almost feel bad for him. But you, it's also good to hear because now you know that this guy, this guy wants to be great. So again, uh, it's it, it's going to take more than just Montgomery. It's going to take, you know, scheme. Hopefully, with Juan Castillo, the new offensive line coach, making it right for the running game. Hopefully, the offensive line you get fewer penalties this year as a whole. That James Daniels takes the next step. He's got to do that. That hopefully Jermaine Effetti can fill in at guard and move Rashad Coward to more of a swing position. So. Yeah, it, it, it truly is dependent upon a lot with the offense as to whether or not we see that jump up from David Montgomery. Now, Mark, I've talked to other people about this, and this is more of a, just an, a general NFL question. I don't know about you, but my sort of confidence level is, is dwindling by the day as far as getting a full season of football in. So I guess uh, maybe one of the last few thoughts from you is – what do you think will happen with this season? Is it a full season? Do you see a reduction? And how many games do you think there will be played if there is? Man, uh, it's a tough prediction. I, I, first of all, I would say I don't – I think that I think I, I think there will be maybe one preseason game. I'll start there. I think that okay. – I think that, yeah, like so the players are saying we want zero. The, the league is saying we like two, so I see a compromise at one. So I'm just doing easy deductive math right there. That maybe one preseason game. I, honestly, I do think that if the season starts on time in the second week of September, if they get to that point, if they do get to that point, I do think there will be a full NFL season this year. That they will have worked out, worked through whatever problems and prognostications. If, if like they're they're not going to let it even get to that game one. So what, if you get to that, there will be 16 games. So I, honestly, as we're all sitting here right now, as much cynicism as there 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 can be, should be, and I'm taking everything into account. I, I think there, guys. I do think there will be an NFL season this year. All right, Mark, we'll get you out of here on this. You're not only do a great job at six seven the score. You've been doing a great job the last couple of years doing, you know, sideline reporting for the Thank Bears. You. But tell everybody about your new podcast well not new personally because you know if you guys are around a couple of us but let me put a list together it's a it's a great podcast if you guys haven't been listening to it you should tell a little bit tell people a little bit more about it mark well, well first of all lakina thank you for asking about it i appreciate that yeah the the name of the podcast is let me put a list together and it's just what it sounds like i do i do this show with uh, a buddy of mine who is a voiceover artist in minnesota his name is brian mitchell we take topics about which we are passionate and not necessarily sports actually i don't think there've been any sports topics yet and we we built it's as simple as that we build a list um, from 10 to 1 from worst to best like, for instance, the last, um, the last show that we did was Top 10 Martin Scorsese films. We have done – yeah, yeah, that's, that's a tough one to put together. Um, the one that we're actually recording actually today um, is going to be – this is a hard one. We're doing – they're so hard that we've added two to the list. It's Top 12 Fast Foods of All Time. So, yeah, yeah, that's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's impossible. It's impossible. So we're, we did that. We've done like Saturday Night Live, uh, late night talk show hosts, a lot of movie topics. So you name it, we do it. We are, as we like to say, guys, we are the premier list making show. Don't trust other list making shows. We're <laughs> it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love awesome. it. On that No, you can follow him on Twitter at Mark Grody Sports. Uh, Mark, this has been great. We got to do this again. Uh, we Anytime. love you and, you know, look, have a, hopefully we'll, we see you on the sidelines in some form, but, <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us, Mark. This has been, this has been very, very entertaining as always. Thanks for having me on guys. Enjoy the rest of your show and hopefully talk to you guys soon. All right. All right. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Later guys. Bye-bye. All right. Bye guys. Bye. Bye, right, Mark. Be safe. Yeah. Yep, you too. All right. So, okay, Jason, we're going to let you have the floor because we haven't seen you in a while and a lot of stuff has been happening or not happening yeah. in some instance. But uh, 
All right, Jason, the floor is yours. Well, gee, where do I start? I mean, uh, there's been a, a, a sort of a whole thing called a pandemic going on around here. It's sort of put a halt on sports uh, as we know it. But um, other than that, you know, things have been okay. Um, I, you know, we were just talking to Mark about uh, possibly having an NFL season. I, I just don't know if we're going to have one at all, at least a full one, that is. Um, um, uh, we're talking about this with our good friend Derek Tate on um, the go route yesterday, actually. And um, we were saying maybe a 12-game season, 14-game season, but um, that's something we're keeping a close eye on here in the league. Um, talking about Patrick Mahomes as well a couple of weeks ago, how he got paid. That's really, really big news here for uh, not only himself, but for the NFL in general. Um, I, I think we're probably all in agreement here that he's you know, the, the future face of the NFL, right? So um, I, I think for me, he was possibly – or probably, I should say, uh, worth every single dollar that he got. And I know it's incentive laden up to, you know, over a little over half half a billion dollars. I have to say that again and out loud. I'm just, I'm shocked at that. But um, again, I mean, I think he's just going to be worth every penny and hopefully he'll stay healthy and have a, a long and story career. Um, and, you know, we're, well, we're about to get some baseball started as well. Um, I'm definitely excited for that. I know it's going to be a shortened season, about 60 games. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys saw the the exhibition at Wrigley yesterday between the Cubs and the Sox. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely want to get your guys' thoughts on that, even though it is an exhibition game. I can, I've I've already seen and heard some Sox fans whooping, and I and and I, I think they're going to have a great year. I think they're going to be really competitive, but um, I just want to caution them just a little bit. But I do think they have a really good team, and I think the Cubs have a really good team, although they didn't quite show it as well yesterday. Uh, so definitely want to hear your guys' thoughts on that. And, of course, we're about to get started with this NBA uh, deal as well. It's pretty much a, a sprint to the playoffs. So that's going to be really exciting. A few teams fighting for only a few spots left. Uh, we've got a lot of guys leaving the bubble and getting snitched on and, and, and secret <laughs> title tales and all of that funny stuff. So uh, definitely want to get you guys' thoughts on that as well. But, you know, um, I, I'm excited for some sense of normalcy to get back into some sports, that's for sure. Um, and, and, and again, you know, how, how have you guys been? How, how, let's start with you, Sid. What, what, what's been new with you, man? Uh, just keeping up doing this as usual with Lakina over the past few weeks. I'm glad you're back on board. First of all, you, you're safe and healthy and your family, I'm assuming they're doing well along with your kids. So I'm glad to hear that. But, um, I'm, just, I'm with you, uh, getting back to some normalcy for sports. Like you said, baseball is starting again this week. Actually, opening day is, is this Thursday as of this podcast. Of course, the Sox and the Cubs open up on Friday. But I, I, we've been, I've been doing this. Uh, of course, the Dean Davis Show, as usual, uh, go to War on Anchor, which keeps you over to Spotify to listen to this show in the Dean Davis Show and all the other program, pro programming as well at WeAreRegalRadio.com. But I, I'm ready to see some normalcy back. Uh, sports is what runs the world, quote-unquote, right, which helps runs the world especially in our economy in the United States. So uh, I, I'm very happy for that. It's just, it's going to be weird. And I uh, watched a couple of the baseball ex ex exhibition games over the weekend, and there's no fans in the stands. That's the toughest thing for me personally. We just have to get used to in, in terms of baseball. Will we see fans in the stands? Hopefully if people still wear that mask and be safe, maybe we can get some fans come playoff time. But right now we just have to uh, face reality that, we will not see any uh, physical fans in the stands. We'll see cutouts like you saw uh, during the Yankees Mets game Saturday night in Shea State. Not Shea State, what's it called? City Field now. Uh, <laughs> you saw some cutouts. And I know the White Sox are doing it as well for charity. I think the Dodgers are doing it as well. So we just had to get used to it for a while. No physical fans in the stands. Yeah, uh, for me, it's same thing, you know, keeping safe and – been doing a lot of baking, <laughs> a lot more baking, like, you know, finding hobbies. Um, but I, I think I'm like everyone, like, I'm sure you guys feel the same way. I think we're ready for live sports. I mean, you, can only, you can only watch so many classic sports for so long, especially, you know, when they, the ones that they show multiple times. I'm glad mm -hmm. live sports are back in some form. Yeah, does it look weird? I'm so sick of looking at the 2013 yeah. NBA Finals. Exactly. So, <laughs> exactly. So, um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, look, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens and we'll see how, you know, it all kind of transpires because, you know, the, the soccer, they've been able to do well without fans so far. Um, and then health-wise, too, um, you know, golf has done pretty well. John Ron, congrats to him. He's now the new number one 
player in the world and deservedly so. Um, but yeah, I, I think, look, I think we're ready for more sports. I mean, we'll get to the college aspect of it later on because I know you'll have a lot, you have a lot to say about that, Jason, but, uh, yeah, I, I think we're starting to get a little bit of normalcy, but look, and I, and I've been, we've been saying this for the last few weeks, Sid, wear your mask. If you want ball, wear your mm-hmm. mask. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree. You, uh, there was a lot of, you know, safety protocols that have been put in place and they're for a reason, you know, and that's, and I think, you know, we were talking to Mark about this again, I have to go back to that, but it's, it's a highly sensitive topic is the player safety uh, and, and the public safety really, you know, and uh, again, like you mentioned, Sid, it's going to be weird uh, to see, you know, you know, only a, a, a 25% capacity or, or no capacity in some of these other stadiums as well, as far as fans go. But, um, you know, again, I think, personal safety is is what's going to you know uh be the prevailing factor here and um it, it's it's interesting to see how these different sports are are handling it as we move forward and and again hopefully like we continue to say get back to a, a sense of uh having some normalcy when it comes to having sports yeah, yeah I, I just want to have a confession to make as of this date uh for recording this podcast today if you go by the original 2020 Chicago White Sox schedule, they were supposed to play the Cubs for the first of two games at Wrigley Field tonight. I was supposed to be there, give you guys a report of the atmosphere and all that, but it, uh, it, it's, it's slightly depressing. But, uh, but coming back to reality, uh, I'm glad we get invited to sports. But it was just some things we got to get used to for, for a while. And I, 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 I'm with you, Jason. We'll get – more into the White Sox later when we have James Fox from FutureSox.com on in our next next segment. But I'm really excited for going back to on the field now. I'm really excited for what the White Sox can bring potentially to the field this year. And like you said, uh, Jason, uh, the Cubs, this is kind of their quote-unquote last dance. Will they use this as a gap year or will, or will they just uh, go for it all if they get off to a hot start because uh, – we have some uh, contracts that are coming up for some key players over the next year or so. Yeah, it'll be interesting because I think both, teams look, look, both teams look really good. I think I think some teams are kind of holding back a little bit. I mean, the Yankees look really good, but you can kind of tell they're starting to kind of hold back a little bit. I mean, Stan hit another home run. I think it's still. I think they're still trying to find that where that where that ball <laughs> was, but uh, where that ball is. But uh, look, I mean, look, I'm looking forward to this season and. Look, we'll see what happens because, like, like we've been saying since these last few weeks, I mean, if you have a bad start, you only got 60 games. So you can't afford to start, like, 10 and 10 or, 50, you know, like, 10 and 15 or something like that because if not, you're going to have a very hard time uh, catching up. And, and, and I think we'll, we'll see. I mean, this is going to be literally be a sprint to the finish. So we'll see if they even finish and We'll see how everyone finishes. And, it, and it's important for both – sides of town uh, as far as their baseball teams are concerned as well because I think we're all in agreement that uh, these divisions are highly competitive uh, when we talk about the AL and the NL Central. Um, the, the the Cardinals are going to be good. The Reds improved mightily. I think they're a dark horse that'll possibly steal the division outright this season. Uh, we know Milwaukee's been really good over the past few seasons. The Cubs have to sort of re-establish or re-prove themselves uh, if, if they want to, you know, continue to be competitive or if they're looking to, to maybe possibly start a rebuild. And as the Sox go, again, we'll get into it a little later, but, uh, you know, I think Minnesota's still going to be good. Um, I, I think Detroit is – well, they're, they're going to be Detroit, but I think they're going to be slightly better. And, you know, I, I think the Sox could be right there to compete for a division, but it's not going to be easy because – these are young guys we're talking about, although talented, they're still young and they still have to learn how to, how to win, especially in a unique season such as this. Like you said, Lakina, it's a, it's a sprint. You know, it's definitely not a 162-game marathon. If you get out to a 500 start those first 20 games, it's going to be really tough to get back into the race, and, which makes it fun and exciting, but um, which you know, could prove to be a detriment to some teams as well. I want to ask you guys this question. Of course, uh, Jason, you brought up, we all brought up the White Sox, and you brought up Cincinnati as well. Do you guys see any other potential surprising teams in baseball this year? I know some people picked Arizona, maybe Tampa Bay, even though they went to the playoffs last year, even though they got knocked down in the first round. Do you guys see any 
other potential surprising teams. Maybe Toronto, even though it looks like they might play their home games in Buffalo this year. I've heard Charlotte, too. I think some people said Charlotte. They might be a place for them. But, yeah, I think Toronto's got to find a place to play. So, if they can sort of, like, you know, stabilize and everything, I think they could probably surprise some people. I think Philly, even though they didn't look good last night, I think they could probably surprise some folks. I mean, yeah, they got Joe Girardi there now, but that's still a very talented team. Arizona, look, look, I mean, Arizona just, you know, kind of fell, fell out, fell off the cliff, if you will, last season. So I'm thinking they're going to want to kind of rebound and get back into it. There's a lot of, you know, Tampa, a lot of people say Tampa might be a sleeper this year. So Look, I think all the teams you teach mentioned, I think I've also had Toronto in there, too, if it, again, once they find some place to play because everything's kind of an upheaval with them right now. Well, for me, I'm going to probably stick out, out in the American League. Uh, you mentioned pretty much all the uh, National League teams for me, Lakina. Uh, I still think the Braves are going to be there as well. Um, um, I, li- I like what the Twins are doing or have done with the addition of uh, Josh Donaldson. Um, I think he, that's, that's a, a sneaky, huge signing for them. Um, but do not forget the power of, of Joe Madden <laughs> and, and uh, the, the Angels. I don't know what city they're currently being called, but I'll just say, I'll just say the Angels. And, uh, Southern California, I think. Yeah, I'm kidding a little bit, but you guys get my point. Um, yeah. Especially with the acquisition of Anthony Rendon, right? I mean, we're talking about an, an MVP candidate, uh, no matter what league he's in. And again, Joe Madden is, is the breath of fresh air that has been sorely needed out there for the Angels. So um, I like those teams. I think another team you, can, you should keep your eye on is the New York Mets. Uh, I know you said North Syndergaard there. Peter Alonzo, uh, he was a rookie last year that hit 50-plus uh, home runs, and he was the only reason why that you watch Mets baseball. I know they got back in the wild card race for a hot minute there, but they fell off after the trade deadline last year. I think maybe the Mets can surprise the people if they can get off to a good start. But uh, it, it's going to be, as you guys say, a race to the finish. If you get off to a real bad start, it is going to be tough. Well, I would just want to say, Sid, Syndergaard's going to be out. You know, he had Tommy John surgery, so he's out oh, for the year. Oh, that's right. Mm. Right, yep. you should have taken the ground there. So, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, true. That's true, even though he's dealing with the back tight. Besides, I'm glad to step up. Yeah. You still got Pete Alonso, too, so that, that'll yep. – I'm sure he'll, he'll you know, lead them in, in home runs as well as well uh yeah like i said this is gonna be very interesting like again we'll talk more with james in a little bit but i I feel like that this is sort of like one of those seasons where anything could happen everybody has a chance to win this and just because it's so this is so unprecedented so i I think this might be like everybody's probably look even seattle i mean (laughs) seattle may have a chance who who knows but uh look this is how weird things have been this year so i uh, all those things, all those teams are probably are w- wide open pretty much. Yeah, well, think about this. Um, I was looking at, and I, I think I, I may have mixed a few of these teams up, but I was looking at something interesting a few days ago um, where if you took, you know, the first 60 games of last year, there would be the, the playoffs would have looked completely different. Um, I think the A's would have made the playoffs last year. Um, I think, well, I, well, the Cubs obviously would have made it last year. They were at the top yeah. of the division through the first 60 games. Um, and, and there's another team that I'm missing that I think that I would have played. I want to say, I think it's it's either Tampa Bay or the Rangers. I want to say I'm I'm not sure. I can't remember which one. But um, the, again, this is what's going to make it fun, right? I mean, because getting off to a good start is going to be so key for some of these quote unquote fringe type teams. I'll, I'll say this about the, the um, parody in baseball. I know people have been complaining about it for years. Well, this is your year uh, of to, to get it right. Like you say, it's a 60-game sprint. And anything can happen. So I don't know how will baseball will, will construct this into the future in terms of more playoff spots and things of that nature. Also, you have to look at the Universal DH. I know they're trying it for this year. The National League has the – the, the DH now, it, uh, we'll see how they work. So if it does, I think it's here to stay. It'll be interesting to see how, they, how the National League teams use their DHs. I know that David Ross mm-hmm. has said that he may use Rizzo in a DH role. He may use Brian in a DH role. So this will be very interesting to see. I mean, Freddie Freeman, I mean, over in Atlanta, will they use him in a DH role for a couple of games? 
Will Alonzo with the Mets, will he be used for as a DH? So this is going to be very interesting to see how a lot of these national teams adjust to this DH, this universal DH rule that's going to take into effect for, for this season anyway. Yeah, and, and I think actually, Sid, I think it's going to be here to stay regardless, I, I, I think, um, because it's something that, that's kind of being pushed behind the scenes or has been pushed behind the scenes in baseball for a while now. So I think it's going to be here to stay regardless. And I, I guess I'm warming up to it. I'm sort of a baseball naturalist, and, you know, I just mm-hmm. kind of wanted to pitch, see the pitchers at bat, but that's just me. Um, but what it will allow for is a lot more flexibility for these National League managers, um, a, a lot more offensive options, obviously. And, again, uh, just that flexibility, because, like you said, when you're, when you're talking about veteran guys like an Anthony Rizzo who – who is tough as nails, but we all know that he's banged up for a good portion of the season a lot of the time. Um, and allows him to get just that little bit of extra rest that's sorely, sorely, sorely needed. Um, again, maybe not for this season, but if it's, con- you know, if it's kept on for future seasons uh, moving forward. So I, it's going to make it a lot more interesting. It's going to make it fun. And again, it's going to allow a lot more flexibility for these managers in the National League. Going back right, to the Cubs, go. I think, Go yeah, ahead. Going back to, yeah, going back to the Cubs, I think Cal Schwarber should be your permanent DH. I know he did okay in the field last year, but he had uh, offensively he had career highs and RBIs with 92 and then home runs with 38. He should be your primary DH guy. But I get what you're saying, Jason, that you could put about three or four or five guys in, in that spot. It depends on uh, uh, what the uh, lineup is for that day, who's the pitcher for the opposite, the opposite pitcher for the for your opponent. So you have about three or four or five guys that you could put right there. Me personally, I think Cal Schwarber should be your permanent DH. But like you, like you said, Jason, whoever gets nicked up that day or just needs to rest from the field, you could put in that spot. You have like four or five guys that can fill that role for that particular day or just for a short period, especially in this year for the 60-game sprint. Well, I mean, yeah, I think mean, that, that DH role is perfect for Schwarber, so – if you're a Cubs mm-hmm. fan, you're hoping that the DH is here, the DH rule is here to stay because if not, I mean, Theo, Theo and Jed, they may try to like maybe ship them off to the, to the AL. Just a thought. Um, yeah, no, go ahead, Jason. No, that's certainly true. Go ahead, Lakina. No, 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 I was just saying, I mean, look, he's a people, everyone says he's sort of a natural sort of DH. So, I mean, listen, we may be seeing him a lot during doing DH for games this year. So you never know. Yep, that's true. All right, so let's switch gears here and talk a little NBA. You got, you know, stuff going on in the bubble, you know, folks, guys snitching on people and, you know, everything <laughs> else has been going on. So guys being sent home, be, you know, Zion, you know, there really hasn't been any update on what's, what's going on with Zion and his family. Um, I know Westbrook's there now, and I know Harden just got there a couple of days ago. So what do you guys think has been happening with all this? Because we talked about it on Friday, said that, look, whatever helps the NBA buzz, because we got a lot of sports going to be coming up in these next couple of weeks. So what do you guys think about what's going on in this little NBA bubble, if you will? <laughs> well, for, for me – no, go ahead, Sid. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, as I said before, the last couple of weeks, Lakina, especially with our guests, uh, it's more the storyline is going to be more what happens away from the court than on the court. I think um, the action on the court eventually is going to take care of itself because guys are getting back in shape the last three or four months. But the storyline is going to be how how do they handle their time away from the court? Uh, we talked about it on our last podcast. Like you know, Dwight Howard was called out for not wearing his mask. Uh, uh, that Houston Rockets player has to be stuck in his room for the next 10 days as we currently speak. So uh, I, I, it's, it's going to be more entertaining from that aspect of it. Uh, that, that quote unquote snitch line, who, who's really going to use, use that snitch line? If you see LeBron James out and about, if you see Giannis answer the coupon about, or Paul George or Kawhi Leonard, who, who's really going to have the guts to call the snitch line to say, oh, I saw a 6'10 black guy out there? <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Jason? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I I didn't think this would be possible a month ago, right? I I just didn't. Um, But I I first just have to applaud the NBA for um, being quick and swift with their actions. Um, Because as we see with the NFL, um, you know, they've taken a a heck of a long time 
to try to get anything put in place. And again, I just I have to applaud the NBA for being as much on top of things as I think has has been possible, at least. Right. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've got this niche line that, like you said, is sort of driving the headlines and keeping people interested. Um, for me, it's all about the race for those final playoff spots. Um, you know, the, the race in the West, we've got Portland, um, New Orleans, and a couple of other teams right there for those final playoff spots. Uh, San Antonio, I think. Um, and, and in the East, it's who's going to, you know, I, I, I know Milwaukee and Toronto are right there at the top of, of the conference, but who else is sort of going to emerge as, as a possible contender? Is it going to be Philadelphia? Is it going to be Miami? Um, you know, Ben Simmons, uh, supposedly, you know, he's, he's been all, you know, almost exclusively working at power forward. You can take that for what you will and, and sort of uh, the, the inconsistency and problems that they had before this, uh, this virus hit in the league was shut down and, and how they're handling the, these quarantine protocols and players leaving the bubble when they come back. And uh, it's, it's, again, we're, we're starting to get this season ramped up uh, here in the next couple of days. So, I'm excited for it and, and, and ready to see who's, um, who's ready to ball and ball out. Also physique-wise and also conditioning, that's what I want to see. I want to see if which guys – and we, we had this with we, – we talked with other guests, Jason, that some guys, have they kept themselves in, themselves in shape these last few months or have some guys kind of just let themselves go? That's going to be the thing also, stamina, too. I mean, if for the East, like you said, Jason, can anybody – beat Toronto and, and Milwaukee can Boston you know can they get it together can Indiana we're now hearing that Oladipo is going to play after there have been some rumors that he wasn't um you know Philly where they're going to be I mean there, there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of unanswered questions and on the you know, in the west I mean can someone can, can anybody beat the Lakers you know can the yep. Clippers uh, the Rockets you know how's it you know how's everything going in Utah the camaraderie there <laughs> since you know it kind of fell flat these the first couple of months after everything was stopped. So it's going to be very interesting to see how these teams, the coaches, and everything else has been going on, and also what the play is going to be like. Yeah, Jake? it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see which teams emerge and uh, which of the other teams well, that are not being looked at, like the Dallas's or the Denver's. Uh, will they surprise some people come playoff time? I was listening to Kenny Smith, um, the Jet Smith, or the analyst for TNT. He was on a national show, and he said that Dallas or Denver could win the title. Uh, could I see that? Sure, especially if someone gets hurt or, heaven forbid, someone catches the coronavirus, if they play the Lakers or whoever, I can see that. I'm not putting my money on it, but I could definitely see that. I think someone – one of the, out of those big teams like the Lakers, Milwaukee, or even Boston, who was playing very well before this pause of the season, I think one of those big four or five teams could get knocked off early here. Yeah, I, I think uh, with this restart, it's it's gonna either sort of derail a season for one team or catapult them to a level that they probably, you know, at least in the public's eye, thought that they couldn't reach again. Uh, I'm kind of with you, Sid. Maybe we're seeing a, a surprising top team go down here or a surprising uh, low team sort of rise up. You know how I feel about Luka Doncic and the Mavericks. So the fact that you said them mm -hmm. um, um, really is, is – I've really got my eye on them as we as we hit this restart button here. A team like Boston I think can go either way. I think they can rise up and, and maybe, you know, possibly overtake the top seed in the East or they could fall off completely, like you said, and maybe even get bounced out in the first round. Um, really early here so I think it, again with with these restarts happening throughout these sports leagues um, it's going to be interesting to see how how these teams sort of refine themselves right I mean I don't think we worry about um, the superstars like um, you know LeBron James obviously he's been here he's done that but um, how would a team like a Milwaukee handle it right because although they've been at the top of the conference going on their second year now um, this is sort of new circumstances for them how does a team like an Indiana react? Of course, like you said, uh, Lakina, with Victor Oladipo now deciding that he wants to play, how do they react to a restart? Because they were one of the teams that people were talking about could possibly win the East as well. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, maybe not the fringe teams, but but the teams that are sort of in the middle and trying to make it to the top, how will they react to this as well? 
And I also wonder, too, about those lower tier teams. I mean, what their mindset's going to be, because they didn't think that they probably would have to play again anymore. Maybe they'll just do like the, the playoffs. So I'm interested to see what Washington is. I know Beal's out because of a shoulder injury, but John Wall said he is going to play. So again, will, will we see something weird happen that a team like a Wizards knock out one of those, knock out a Milwaukee or Toronto? So look, this look like, like I said, it's all it's pretty much a free for all right now. So yeah, yep. thinking about yeah, thinking about this, uh, uh, going back to the Lakers, we had Michael Lee on the NBA senior writer from the Athletic back in February, obviously before this shutdown. Uh, we asked him like, which team, if you're the Lakers, that you don't want to see in, in the first round? I remember I said Portland. Now they're healthy. Carmelo looks. Uh, but like he's in the best shape of his of his life. We all know that Damian Lillard's, Lillard's always going to be there. He can overtake a series to steal a couple of games and force a game seven. C.J. McCollum, who's been injured off and on all year, he's healthy again. So if you're the Lakers, between Memphis, Portland, and New Orleans, assuming that Zion Williamson comes back in time for the restart, out of those three teams, if you're a Lakers fan, you do not want to see Portland. Oh, no, not at all. Go ahead, you, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for me, it's it's the team that I, I, you know, if I'm the Lakers, I don't think I might want to see. It's New Orleans. I mean, I, don't, I get what you're saying completely uh, in Portland, uh, Sid, because I think, you know, um, again, with with a, the with a skinny mellow, um, it's they could be a scary team if he's determined and focused. And, of course, Dame Time, Dame Lillard, you know how I feel about him. He's one of my more favorite mm-hmm. players in the league to watch. But, man, there is something about – the way New Orleans was playing before this this thing got shut down, yeah. the way they were starting to gel. Of course, we know what Zion Williamson is bringing to the table. Um, I think he's he's probably even surprised and or surpassed some of the goals that people had for him. Uh, you know, coming you know coming off of his in, injury and having to you know get into the league here a little bit late into the season. Um, but but listen, for as much slack as I've given him throughout his early career. Lonzo Ball is really starting to establish himself as a top point guard in this league. He's starting to shoot the ball with consistency. That has always been my point with him. Um, he's a great, uh, a great point guard. He's a floor general, but he has to shoot the ball better, and he's been doing that. Um, Brandon Ingram, I mean, can't say enough about the way he was playing as well. Um, quickly becoming an all-star in this league. You know, I, obviously, I don't want to say living in LeBron's shadow out in L.A., but, of course, with, with his arrival, um, I think it really halted his development as far as him being a, a really good player in this league. And um, I, it, Mr. Drew Holiday, I mean, I mean, he, the, the guy has been one of the most underrated players we've had in this league for the better part of the past decade. And I just really think that they are a really dangerous team if they can make the playoffs. I don't think anybody wants to play them. Yeah, I don't think if you're a Lakers, I don't think you want to see either of them. <laughs> if you if you if you had to help it, I mean. Look, we know who New Orleans are. I mean, look, they were just starting to gel right before everything stopped. And Portland, Portland was sort of up and down, but they were kind of starting to kick things into gear before everything stopped. And I think Melo feels that this might be his last shot to kind of make his mark in the playoffs. So I think he's going to want to, you know, take his game to a new level. Him and Dame, I've been, they've been getting better and better, you know, you know, you know, collaborating. So it'll be interesting to see what, what happens there because I, I think either one of those Western Conference teams, if you're one of those top teams, if you're Houston or the Lakers or the Clippers, you don't want to see you don't want to see either, either one of those Pelicans or the like of the Blazers teams because I think they might be able to pull off that upset. I think I'm not saying that'll happen, but they may they'll push them, no doubt. And and let's not forget Memphis as well. Um, I think people, you know, we didn't hadn't talked about them yet, but um, I think with Zion sort of making his debut I think you know the Pelicans have have sort of overtaken it as far as notoriety uh in the league but but John Morant and Jaron Jackson are becoming one of the better one-two punches in the league as well they're still really dangerous too yeah just wrap it up on the Western Conference you guys uh let's not forget as you mentioned Lakina about Houston I know um James Harden just um uh, went to Orlando just gotten down there Russell Westbrook, he says he's okay from the coronavirus. I, I don't know if he's with the, uh, reunited with the team. Yeah, I know he, if, if not, he'll be reunited with them soon. And also, let's look at Utah. I know there's chemistry issues between Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. But Oklahoma City, who has been a surprise team in the NBA this year before this shutdown, Chris Paul, 
uh, I'm not saying they're going to go all the way, but then maybe they can put it, it, a surprise and addendum into some people. So you have to watch out for them as well. Absolutely. Um, going over, going out, uh, out east for a little bit. Do you guys think can anybody, you know, beat Milwaukee or Toronto? I know, I, I know. I said it. Look, don't be surprised that the Wizards somehow upset one of those teams should it end up being that way. But I think the East is a little more. You know, I don't want to say like you know, it's just like Milwaukee and Toronto and then everybody else. But I think if those mid-tier teams, if Boston, if they can get it together, if Philly, you know. We'll see how Ben Simmons' shot is, but I think it's really, I think it's going to, it is kind of Milwaukee and Toronto and everybody else. I hate feeling that way, but I really didn't see anything from the team, other teams that I've mentioned, like right before everything ended. So what do you guys think? Well, I think well, Toronto. Teams. Go ahead, go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, quickly, I think <laughs> Toronto is a, is a team that you cannot ignore. No, they don't have Kawhi Leonard anymore, but they could be a threat come playoff time. I, um, Philadelphia, who I picked to lose to the Lakers in the finals uh, in the beginning of the season, they do have a shot now with Ben Simmons back, but I, something is still not right with that team, so I'll leave that alone. But I'm looking at the Boston Celtics. They they were playing very well well before the shot. I remember they beat the Lakers. Uh, they almost beat the Lakers on the road, if, if my memory serves correct, a uh, month before the shutdown. So, and Jason Taylor has been having a great year, so I'm I'm looking at the Boston Celtics and Milwaukee. Can, can I get it done? Yeah, yeah, Sid. Um, you mentioned both teams that I'm going to mention as well. I'm, I'm just going to kind of piggyback on what you're saying because the two teams I have my eyes on are the Boston Celtics and the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, and for the 76ers, I'll, I'll flip it just a little bit. It's not as so much about Ben Simmons or Joel Embiid for me. It's, this is about Brent Brown. Uh, for me is this is about what he's going to do to put these players and have this team be successful because there's no way they they got they should have gotten off to the start that they did Um, I think they're in the fifth or sixth seed right now before this restart is is getting ready to begin again Um, they should be one or two let's just let's just put it out there right now I mean Toronto had a great season Uh, give give them and Nick Nurse a ton of credit I really really do but um, it, 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 sh- it should probably be Milwaukee and Philadelphia if we're talking about the top teams in the East right now, and that's not the case. So for me, um, again, I mentioned it earlier, you know, uh, having Ben Simmons practice exclusively at the point forward or at the power forward spot, excuse me, um, no longer uh, running the point for the team. We'll see how that works. But, but again, it's, this is not about the players for me. This is about the coach and what he's doing with these players as far as Philadelphia goes. And for Boston, I couldn't agree with you more, Sid. Uh, for those people that don't know, Jason Tatum is going to be an MVP candidate in the next year or two. And um, you were starting to see that before this thing got shut down in the season. Um, this guy was dropping 30 and 40 points at will. And I think the playoffs is just going to put that much bigger of a spotlight on him. And I think he's going to shine that much more because of it. Um, again, I think they're a team that could, you know, rise up. And, and maybe take a second or number one seed uh, when they get this restart, or they could fall off the table a little bit because they were playing so well before the shutdown. But uh, those are the two teams for me. Yeah, I think I would, I would put Boston right there with Toronto and Milwaukee, I think. Because I think they've earned it. I think, like you said, Tatum Tatum has been playing has been playing lights out, lights out before everything shut down. Will that, will that continue, though? Because you're talking, what, four months after that? So... Yeah. Again, that that momentum just stopped just like that, and it will. It's going to be very hard to kind of restart and get that momentum back. But again, if, if anybody can do it, I think Boston can, because they got the they got the personnel and they got the coach doing it. And Brad Stevens. So interesting to see what do they do, what what they do. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, I got a great idea. Lay it on us. This quick break. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take this quick break. Let's get ready for segment number two. We'll get into college football and all of the stuff happening. But first, before all that, James Fox from futuresocks.com will hop on with us to preview the 2020 Chicago White Sox because the season starts on Friday for them and for, for everybody else in Major League Baseball. It's Jason Pfeiffer, Lakina McGee, I'm Timmy Brown. You're listening to Second City Sports Zoom Style.
Yeah, we can't hear Lakina even though we're recording. But yeah, it well, shows us a recording. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, stop recording. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so we hit the record button. All right. Welcome back to segment two of Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. <laughs> Along with Lakina McGee and Jason Pfeiffer, I am Sydney Brown. And right now we have on special guest Mr. James Fox from FutureSox.com as we preview the 2020 Chicago White Sox, as you guys well know. We're uh, having a welcome back to baseball segment. The regular season for the rest of Major League Baseball will start this Friday. And James is here to help us preview the South Siders as big expectations are rising. Uh, around our city as far as the men in the black and white. James, welcome to the program. How are you today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. Where can people follow you on social media? Uh, so on Twitter, I'm at JamesFox917. Um, I don't really, I don't use <clears throat> Instagram, so it's pretty much, pretty much just Twitter game for me. You're a smart man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's start off with uh, with the White Sox. Uh, of course, uh, as we record this podcast, they are in the middle of their exhibition season right now. Of course, we'll reference uh, the game on Sunday night between the Sox and the Cubs. The Cubs led to nothing early, but the White Sox offense came through with a big uh, fifth inning, which led them to a 6-3 victory. James, as we expect as Sox fans, the offense looks good on paper, but it really came alive on Sunday night. Uh, do you expect more of that as, this, uh, as the 2020 season arrives? Yeah, I do. I think it's a really deep lineup, obviously. I think, you know, we saw firsthand some of the free agent signings um, and how that could impact the club. Yasmani Grandal, Edwin Encarnacion, they're just, you know, they're professional hitters. I think everybody wants to see the young guys, right? And Luis Roberts, like, kind of been the talk of – of camp, but you did bring in, you know, veterans. It's a really, really deep lineup. I think they can do that um, to a lot of teams, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk pitching here at some point. Like I understand, you know, being a little concerned maybe about the pitching, but I do think they're going to hit and hit quite a bit. And, you know, you saw some people last night talk about Gerald Cotton, right? And they're like, oh, it's off Gerald Cotton. Yeah. It's not that big of a deal. But I mean, man, they're going to, they're going to face a lot of bad pitching and, that's how you get good, right? You beat on yeah. bad pitching. So, you know, with 24 games this year against the Tigers, the Royals, and the Pirates, and, you know, you, you got to beat up on those teams, and you got to beat fourth and fifth starters and bad relievers and stuff. And, you know, we saw last night they could put up five or six in a hurry. What about the defense, though, James? Because that was sort of like the, the number one thing that kind of held them back like, the last year. What do you what do you think that they're that they're going to do to try to improve the the defense? So I think they improved it, you know, at catcher with Yasmani Grandal. And the one thing about Luis Robert that I've always kind of talked about is, like I you know I followed him coming over. I covered the international market for Future Sox, but man, the, the defense on him was undersold like quite a bit. It was kind of like you know we're going to get this star that's going to maybe get big and move to right field at some point. Like, uh-uh. Like, he's a plus defender in center field. Like, so, you know, that should help because, you know, to answer the question, the corner outfield defense isn't very good. But we've seen, like, he's gone from, you know, like sideline to sideline making up for Mazzara and uh, Eloy Jimenez's shortcomings out there. So, you know, I do think Adam Engel is valuable as a fourth outfielder. He can come take over and left or right late in games if they – you know, if they have a lead, their defense at first base won't be great with Abreu, obviously, but it's first base defense. Um, we'll see what they do at second base here. I don't think Nick Madrigal starts at the club, but I think, you know, he's their best defensive second baseman. So I think once he's at second um, and, you know, Robert's going to be in center every day, I think their defense will be a lot better. I think, you know, their corner outfield defense is weak, but I think it's debatable how important corner outfield defense is. And speaking of defense, uh, James, it, it all starts with pitching, right? And at least the big acquisition on that side was, of course, uh, Dallas Keuchel coming over from, from Houston. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that acquisition. I personally think it, it, might, have, it might be the biggest move that they could have made in the offseason. Uh, again, it's just a personal opinion, but I thought it was sneaky good for them to pick up Keuchel. Um, again, with him and Lucas Giolito, you're, you're okay at the top. 
but just talk to us about that acquisition and how it it could <clears throat> and may have stabilized at least the, uh, the the rotation somewhat. Yeah, so I mean, they had to do something, right? Like they they were hard after Zach Wheeler. They actually thought they had Zach Wheeler. Zach Wheeler decided to stay on the East Coast. So then you're kind of pivoting, right? And I think as White Sox fans, we're like, oh, man, like they're going to miss out again on pitching because Dallas Keuchel's a Scott Boris client. Everybody's worried that, you know, Reinsdorf doesn't, hire, doesn't sign Boris guys. And then the Keuchel thing got done. Um, you know, like Dallas Keuchel isn't probably a number two starter anymore, but he's, you know, he's a valuable piece in the rotation because he just pitches. He pitches every time he's supposed to pitch. He can do his, you know, go six or seven innings. That brings back to the, you know, the defensive question that we asked. And one of the guys that I didn't mention, obviously, is Tim Anderson, who has all the tools to be a really good defensive shortstop, but has had, you know, lapses um, on defense with, with throwing. And he's, he's uh, you know, just like made errors on maybe some stuff that he, that he shouldn't. And then he makes the bigger plays. Infield defense is going to be big for Dallas Keuchel because Dallas Keuchel is going to keep the ball on the ground um, quite a bit. So, you know, it wasn't a ton of money. It was three years, $55 million for Keuchel. I think he's a veteran. I think he helps the rest of the pitching staff, too. So I do think, you know, it, it's not sexy, right? Like, it's not Zach Wheeler's 28, maybe coming into his own. You could have maybe, um, I guess, made the argument that you'd have, like, your co-young aces with, with Lucas Giolito and, and Zach Wheeler. But it's okay. Like, Dallas Keuchel's fine. He can be a three or a four going forward but you know, like what he brings is consistency. So yes, obviously that that's like a big part of what they did this off season. And he's going to be a really important piece. James Fox of futurestocks.com joins us on Sex TV Sports Zoom style, along with Jason Pfeiffer and Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. James, let's stick with that pitching staff for a minute. Michael Kopech uh, op- is opting out this 2020 season. And Carlos Rondon is coming off of, of the Tommy John surgery. Assuming that he's going to rejoin the ball club at some point, whether it's early August or mid-August. Uh, but for the time being, who slips in, into Michael Kopech's spot? You have uh, Gio Gonzalez. You may have uh, Dad Wilder, who looked good in short relief last night. Who's going to fill in Kopech's spot for this season? Yeah, so I think they have six um, starters right now. And then obviously they have <clears throat> they have Dane Dunning and Jimmy Lambert, too, who I can talk about in a second. I actually think Rodon's ready to go. I mean, they, you know, they've been throwing him like four innings. I can't really see them using Carlos Rodon under the bullpen. This is like, you know, the one question that I still have about this team right now, as far as like what Ricky's going to do. Right. Because they brought in Gio Gonzalez to kind of like anchor the back end of that staff. But right now you could make the argument that he's probably like the sixth most important guy, like in the pecking order. Right. Like for all of, um, Ronaldo Lopez's shortcomings, I can't see them giving up on Ronaldo Lopez right now. So the thing that I'm curious to see is whether it's, you know, Ronaldo Lopez and Cease are probably both in this rotation. Who does that last spot go to right now? Is it Carlos Rodon or is it Gio Gonzalez? You know, if I was predicting, I think it's Carlos Rodon. They'll use Gio Gonzalez like out of the bullpen or they'll piggyback him, you know, with one of the other guys, Lopez, Cease, one of them. And then I think, you know, 40-man spots are really important. So this, you know, they get the 60-man player pool, right? And they get 30 players on Friday to start the year with for the first two weeks. But those 30 players still have to come from your 40-man roster. So it's tough to add, like you brought up a Ross Detweiler who's not currently on the roster. Their roster is at 39 players right now. They could add a Ross Detweiler, but then if you're going to add a Nick Madrigal or, a, you know, a, uh, Chesler Cuthbert, possibly, you're talking about getting rid of a guy off your 40. So um, that's where I think Dane Dunning and Jimmy Lambert could come into play. Those are two guys that we follow pretty exclusively at Future Sox. They're both getting over Tommy John surgery. You know, Jimmy Lambert got two innings in last night. I was actually kind of surprised. I mean, he's 12 months from Tommy John. Like He's, he's back early, mm-hmm. and he's throwing better than, you know, better than he ever has. Jimmy Lambert was kind of a – you know, a two-seamer slider guy coming out of Fresno State. And, you know, they totally reworked him now to be like a high four-seamer, high four-seamer breaking ball guy. So, yeah, I mean, those those guys could find themselves in bullpen rows. I'm very curious to see the short leash on some of the starting pitching. How soon do you go to your bullpen, right? Are you throwing guys multiple innings in the middle of games, um, using things like a little bit more um, untraditionally? I guess I would say, 
early on just to, you know, kind of see what they're going to do. I think we're really going to find out a little bit about Ricky Renteria this year that maybe we, maybe we didn't otherwise, you know, know about him managing bad teams. James, let's talk about Edwin Encarnacion for a second. The, the grizzled veteran, if you will. He had a big home run. Nice a big horn last night. He'll probably be using the DH role a lot. What do you think he brings to the White Sox? I just think he's a professional hitter. I think it's, you know, we looked at it this offseason, right? And you got James McCann, who had a pretty solid year last year. Um, but he should really only face lefties. You know, you could make the you could have made the argument that once you added Grandall, you're just gonna use McCann and Zach Collins, who I'm a fan of too. And kind of just do it that way. But instead, no, they went out and they signed like an everyday DH. And, you know, it's an everyday DH that's hit, what, 36, 37 homers a year for the last like five, six years. I mean, he's, he's just a professional slugger. And he, you know, him and Jose Abreu both very, very good, very solid against left-handed pitching. So that's the one thing. Like, I think the White Sox should, should absolutely mash against left-handed pitching this year. I think he, you know, he'll slot in either fourth or fifth pretty much every day. I think he'll play some first, but like Jose Abreu doesn't really like DHing. So my guess is your DH most days is Edwin Encarnacion or even Grandal when they want to get McCann in there. I, I, I think it's a big deal. I think it's, you know, one of those signings, it's like a one year, like $11 million deal, whatever that is, you know, and he doesn't really offer any defensive value, but he doesn't, he doesn't need to, right? Not if he's, you know, going to, going to hit, you know, 35 homers over a 162 game season. I mean, you know, he could hit, he could hit 10 or 12 here in a, in a short season over 60 games, I think. Right. So, you know, I want to see, I want to see that parrot at US Cellular or at Guaranteed Rate Field. James, you, you touched on something um, that I really want you to expand on because I am in agreement with you. Um, we've seen Ricky Renneria manage bad teams, right? That's kind of been the manager he's been uh, since he's been managing. But he's got a team now that's kind of expected to to compete and do some things this year. So what are sort of your expectations from him? Um, how do you think he's going to handle this thing this upcoming season and, and possibly into the uh, into future seasons? Yeah, so I'm hopeful that he, like, lets some of his guys play. Like, you know, I'm not a big fan of the, the bunting and some of that old school National League stuff. I understand it with a horrible team, and he kind of wants to, you know, kind of wants to see what guys can do certain things, like in past years. But now – you know, I, no, I, I want you playing like an American League team. Now, what I'll say about Ricky Renteria is I think most managers um, get too much blame. I think there's probably five really good managers in baseball. Terry Francona, um, you know, you guys, you guys probably know the good ones. Bob Melvin in Oakland. And then there's probably five pretty bad ones. And then the other 20 are kind of similar. I think Ricky's probably in that 20. Um, and then he lets Don Cooper, like, handle his pitching staff. So. I guess like the pitching in a season like this, I think the pitching decisions are probably the most important, right? How soon do you go get a guy? Um, how do you, how do you use your bullpen? Stuff like that. Don't mess with the lineup too much. Don't give away outs. I was actually kind of surprised that Ricky said he didn't like the rule, the extra inning rule where the guy goes on second base to like start extra innings. And that, that kind of surprised me because I think the only time that like, you know, sack bunting is acceptable is when there's a guy on second and no outs, right? You move him over to third, you got two outs to play with. So I, I actually thought that, that that he would like that. He, he would, like, turn into a little bunt fest for him. So, but I guess, like, the lineup stuff early, who does he put where? Who does he prioritize? Like, who does he get the most at bats for at the top of the lineup? And then how they handle his pitching staff. I'm really curious to see – what he decides to do with the three, four, five spot in his rotation. I think we're going to find that out this week, hopefully. I want to go back to Tim Anderson, James. Uh, of course, off the field over the last couple of years, uh, he's only one of two African-American um, baseball players in the city of Chicago. The other one is Jason Hayward of the Cubs. Of course, we all know that Tim Anderson brings the flair uh, to the field. And, of course, Sox fans, including yours, surely had his back during the whole quote-unquote backflip incident last year with the – Kansas City Royals, he fell short of making the all-star team. But it seems like to me from the outside looking in that he's really embraced being one of the front men for the White Sox, but on and off the field. I want to get your thoughts on Tim Anderson being one of the faces, if not the face for this White Sox franchise. Yeah, so I think he is kind of the face. I, I, look, I, I don't think he's their best player, and I don't think he's going to be their best player, but he's definitely mm -hmm. 
their most recognizable player for sure. And it's something that they've needed. I mean, I feel like the whole, well, the whole marketing campaign is based around Tim Anderson, right? Change the game. That's, Mm -hmm. that's his type of thing. I mean, they've embraced fun. They've pushed back against some of this old school thinking that, you, you know, you can't have fun on a baseball field. You know, his, the bat flip is, you know, he, he flipped his bat. Um, he looked in his dugout to pump up his own teammates. He's not showing anybody else up. So, you know, I think it's good. <clears throat> um, you know, I do think Yohan Mankata, Ismani Grandal, Luis Robert, those guys are probably better players going forward. But if Tim Anderson's like the front man for your team, like I think that's good. I don't know if anybody – ESPN was blocked out or blacked out locally last night, you know, so everybody locally mm-hmm. probably watched it on NBC Sports Chicago. But, you know, he got into it a little bit with – Rick Sutcliffe and the ESPN guys last night. He's like, oh, y'all forgot about us, you know, because yeah, ES- yeah. ESPN, for, ESPN forgets about the White Sox all the time. He kind of called them out for it. I think it's great. I think um, Tim Anderson talks the talk, but he walks the walk too, right? He, him and his family, um, I think he moved to Flossmore because he wants, you know, he wants to be part of the community. He's not just, you know, saying a lot of that stuff. So it's good that, you know, the White Sox haven't had – you know, a recognizable star, like in a while, right? Probably even since like Frank Thomas, Chris Sale was awesome, but I mean, he wasn't, you know, this type of star player. I mean, Tim Anderson is, you know, the most recognizable name, I think, on that team. And I think it, I think it's a good thing that they, you know, they finally have somebody that they can like market around. Who do you think can challenge the White Sox? Is? I mean, I think Minnesota still has a shot and I know some folks have said that they could take a step back, but if the White Sox are favored in this in this whole setup with the sixty games, if not, who who are the who are the favorites? So, you know, in AL Central, I think Minnesota probably is still the favorite. I, I don't love Minnesota's starting pitching, so I think, you know, this first series is going to be big, right? Like, it, it's going to be tough for me because I'm one of these people who like, you know, I really like look at the like long haul, right? Like, you lose an early season series, it's not the end of the world. But this year, it, this year it might be. So, you know, the Minnesota lineup is really good. I think the Sox and Minnesota could kind of go tit for tat a little bit um, where they like hit each other's pitching up pretty good. Minnesota has a good bullpen. So, you know, I guess just I I would still consider Minnesota to be the favorite, but I think the White Sox have more upside for sure, right? Because you could have you could have a Luis Robert start off hot, never really realize what it's like to, you know, to, to falter over 162. And, and then really take off, right? And then the team that I find interesting is Cleveland because over 162, I, I was going to pick Cleveland to finish like third in the division probably because I think that their owner is going to sell off some parts, um, you know, spe- specifically uh, Frankie Lindor, maybe Mike Clevenger. Um, but in a 60-game season with their pitching, I mean, if they won the World Series, I wouldn't be surprised. So I think with them, it just depends on their start. Like if they start bad – sell off some parts I think it's a two-team race um I do think while I wouldn't pick the White Sox necessarily over the Twins they got as good a shot as anybody over 60 games because it's you know it's so fast it's like it's like the playoffs right variance trumps everything right you could have you could have a player that's like an average ball player can be awesome for three weeks at a time and if that happens in a year like this like that could really propel a team that you might not have thought about otherwise Go ahead, Sid. Okay. I want to ask you about uh, Luis Robert. Of course, watching these inner squad games last week, we all know that he could murder, murder the baseball, and he did it again last night in Wrigley Field. Of course, what I've been impressed about is his defense, and I know we as Sox fans uh, were looking forward to seeing that this year. Uh, I put this out on my Twitter and Instagram last night. Uh, I think he's an early candidate for AL Rookie of the Year. Uh, what do you project that Luis Robert will do in this 60-game season? Yeah, so I think he's the favorite for AL Rookie of the Year. I'd predict him to win it. Um, the one thing I've said is I think he might struggle a little bit um, offensively. So Luis Robert had a 21% swinging strike rate at Charlotte. Now, I don't think it's anything like long-term, but he doesn't look to walk. He looks, you know, he looks to hit. And I think we saw it in the first at bat last night against Kyle Hendricks, right? He came up there, he's completely fooled on three pitches, but then he made adjustments and he, you know, he, he fisted one over the second baseman's head into right field. 
And then he, like we talked about a little bit earlier, he got to feast on some bad pitching and hit one off the wall. So I think he will struggle at times, I think, against starters that are going to make him look y- like as young as he is. But I, I just think that he hits he hits mistakes so well and he hits bad pitching so well that I think he's in for, you know, a pretty big year. I don't, I don't think he has the best offensive season on the team, but the one thing that's different about him than other guys, like Eloy Jimenez last year came up, struggled more than anybody thought he would. Right. And he Mm -hmm. didn't really, and he doesn't really have any redeeming defensive qualities. Luis Robert can be like a plus defender in center field, plus runner on the base pass, plus throwing arm. So I mean, even if he struggles a little bit offensively and hits down in the seven hole, I mean, he's still going to, like, make a difference in baseball games. So I don't even know – like, you called him a contender for AL Rookie of the Year. I think he's the favorite, honestly. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. would I be surprised if somebody else got it? No. But I think, you know, the easy way, if you're making predictions, that that's probably the guy, I think. I'm, well, go ahead, because I'm, I'm – I'm, he answered all my oh. questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, we have a couple more minutes left okay. with James Fox of uh, FutureSox.com right here on Second City Sports. Uh, I want to talk to you about Andrew Vaughn. Of course, he was picked um, last year. Basically, as I looked at it from the outside looking in, he was picked to re- replace Jose Abreu. Of course, Jose Abreu was brought back for, uh, in the offseason for a couple of years on a free agent deal. Uh, looks like Andrew Vaughn, he could be uh, still maybe a future piece. Uh, for the White Sox, it looks like he can be a, a good hitter. What do you see out of Mr. Vaughn? What, do you think he'll he'll make a big impact this season, or do we wait another year for him to, to come up <clears> in the White Sox uniform? So I don't think we're going to see him in, in this year, honestly. I think he's going to go over to Schaumburg, and he'll, like, stay over in Schaumburg. Now, look, if something happens to Edwin Encarnacion and they just, like, decide that Andrew Vaughn's their, like, next best guy – I wouldn't be surprised. I just like wouldn't predict it. Like he he was going to go to the Double A Southern League this year, or you know, and play for the Birmingham Barons. And I, you know, he's a top 30, 35 prospect in baseball. I fully expected him to do well there, and I thought he'd be in the mix to be their starting first baseman as soon as twenty twenty one. You know, I think this season's weird. I don't know what they're gonna, you know, what they're gonna want developmentally out of him. I do think there's a high likelihood that he plays a big role for the 2021 White Sox. I'd be, you know, I'd just be surprised if we saw him this year. Obviously they're moving him around a little bit. Some of that was because Yohan Moncada was out. I don't think he can play third base every day. I think he's a first baseman. Obviously, like you said, they brought Jose Abreu back. So he's got two more years after this one. Um, I do think he's a, he's an important part of the future. Um, and when you're picking third overall in a baseball draft, you take the best player available, and that was Andrew Vaughn at the time. You know, he's he's an impressive hitter um, from the right side, and it's unfortunate that he's not going to get to play really much affiliated baseball. The hope is that, you know, some of this coronavirus gets gets under control in certain areas, and they're able to have some sort of extended prospect league like that's been talked about out in Arizona. But as of right now, the scouts – and people that I've talked to are not optimistic about, you know, being able to play baseball in Arizona in the fall. So that that's unfortunate for him. He, he's an interesting guy to watch, but I think after Friday, right, once the season starts, I don't I don't know how much we're going to hear from him because I think he's going to be over in Schaumburg practicing with that that uh, alternate site taxi squad team. All right, last question for James Fox before we spring you. Uh, your prediction for the White Sox for 2020 – do we see playoffs on the south side, or do we have to wait for another year? Oh, man, I think I'm going to make everybody angry. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we're going to wait um, till 2021. Honestly, like, I was hoping for the expanded playoffs because then I thought they'd definitely get in. You know, if mm-hmm. they added, like, another mm-hmm. team or two, I thought it was, like, the perfect opportunity for them. I would not be surprised if they go, like, 35 and 25 and win the division. I just won't predict it. I do think they'll be over 500. I just feel like in the American League, if they don't win the Central, um, it's tough to win one of those wild cards when you have Yankees and Rays out East, and then you have the, you know, the uh, the Oakland A's and Houston to deal with too, right? So I feel like I'll, I'd pick them second in the AL Central right now, um, falling just outside. But I mean, I don't think anybody should be upset with that if if they kind of show that you know, they're a team on the rise. If Luis Roberts really good, if if uh, Eloy Jimenez is, is better than he was last year, if Yohan Moncada is pretty much the same guy and maybe their pitching 
falters a little bit, and that's the reason why, you know, they don't get there. But honestly, if all those offensive guys are good, they might win the division. So, you know, you, you could convince me. I'm just not going to predict it. Okay. That was James Fox of FutureSox.com. You can follow him on Twitter at JamesFox917. Once again, it's at JamesFox917. James, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Keep up the great work over there. Uh, let's do this again sometime. And hopefully we will be talking about a winning season. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Anytime, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks James. James. All righty. All right, and that was James Fox of FutureSox.com uh, hopping on with us to talk uh, White Sox baseball preview in the 2020 season. I want to start with you, Lakina. I, 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 if this was a regular 162 game season, I would have, I, I would agree with James right there that they were, they would be close to a playoff spot, but not quite ready for prime time yet. Of course, you have to consider. Johan Mankata, um, he's back now, but you have to consider now what Johan Mankata has gone through with uh, having COVID-19 and Michael Kopech, which I was going to say originally, and now that he's out for this season, I think that pitching staff is still going to be good, but I don't know if it's going to be good enough. I, I, I think they will make progress. I think way better than last year, but I think they're just going to come up just short. I Yeah, I'm with you, Sid. I, I think that I think, look, Minnesota's, they're pitching, but like, like we, we be talking about Minnesota's pitching is still questionable, but they've got the heading mm-hmm. from top to bottom. And I don't, they're not going to break any records with their own runs, but like they did last right. year. But I think, look, I think it, I think this division is Minnesota's to lose. And like James mm-hmm. said, don't be surprised if Cleveland, especially since it's only 60 games, they may, this might be their last dance. If you, their, their last chance or last dance, if you will yeah. kind of get back into it. So I know a lot of White Sox fans are excited. They think they can make the playoffs. Look, they've got a shot, especially with the extra mm-hmm. playoff spot. But I just think that with Minnesota and also Cleveland, too, it's going to be tough. Yeah, there's, there's going to be one too many teams I think that the Sox would have, to, it would have to jump over as well. I'm kind of with James Fox on that assessment as well. Um, you know, talking about an Oakland, Houston maybe even a Texas Rangers, a team that's under the radar out there in the AL West uh, could possibly shock some people in a 60 game season. But of course uh, you've got the Rays and the Yankees out East. And again, that, that, that Cleveland Indian squad, like, like you both mentioned could definitely uh, sneak in and surprise some folks as well. So I think it's going to be one too many teams for the Sox to jump over to compete, but I think they will compete just not for a playoff spot this year. As you guys said, uh, Cleveland, they're, they're the wild card team. Excuse the expression out of all of this. If this was a 162-game season, I agree with you. James. I think would have, I would have had them third because, remember, at this time last year, they were struggling. Trevor Barrow, who eventually was traded to the Cincinnati Reds, he, uh, he struggled. And they had injuries to their pitching staff. Now, they didn't, didn't make a late comeback uh, charging the Twins, but it was too little, too late. But uh, – you guys are correct. I think Cleveland does have a shot in this 60-game schedule. If they get off to a bad start, I think it is a two-team race between the, the Twins and the White Sox, assuming both of those teams get off to a good start. But uh, for the White Sox, if they struggle out the gate, and let's just say they make a, a last-minute attempt, it's just too many teams, uh, guys, to get over that, uh, get to be in contention for that wild card spot. Like you mentioned, Jay, you have Texas there in their new stadium this year. You have Oakland, you have Tampa Bay, uh, Toronto. If they can make some noise, uh, they're they're going to be in it. So you got to hop over four or five, perhaps six teams uh, if you can uh, stay and strive for strive with Minnesota. Yeah, it'll be, look like like I said. I mean, it'll be very interesting. Like like you said, if if look look, no team can afford to have a bad start. So if mm-hmm. they can over, if they can, their defense though is still a concern for me with the White Sox. So the hitting, the hitting I'm, I'm not worried about is their defense. I know James sort of, mm-hmm. you know, explained a lot of like, you know, the infield and off-field defense and the, and the catching defense, but they're still very young and that, and that still worries me. I'll just, just, just leave it there. So one question that I would like to ask you guys um, is that would you feel differently about the Sox playoff chances if Michael Kopeck didn't opt out of the season? I to be honest with you, yeah, but to be honest with you, I, I, I'll say yes because he was, 
if it, if it wasn't for this uh, pandemic, he would have been on the Ennis restriction anyway because of of his Tommy John surgery situation because he hasn't pitched over a year, almost a year and a half now. So uh, I think that uh, he that probably would have used him out of the bullpen anyway or just pitched him uh, four, maybe five innings. I think that's what's going to happen with all these teams as the this shortened season uh, gets on the way. I, I would have given them a better chance, but uh, with Kopech not, not opting out this year, uh, they still have a chance, like you mentioned, Lakina, because of their offense, but their pitching staff, even though it still looks good on paper, it takes a step back because uh, Kopech is not there. Of course, it, it would have been a risk because we we would have not known what we would have seen from him, even though he did look good early on before he opted out. But it, it, the pitching staff, uh, predictions takes a notch down just slightly, but I still expect them to be good at some point. But as you mentioned, Lakina, and we had Russell Dor- Dorsey on a couple of weeks ago. I think the uh, uh, the offense for around baseball is going to carry the way uh, uh, as the pitching staffs were trying to get themselves in, uh, in in good footing. I think for the for the White Sox, uh, it is really going to be important. And I think uh, nothing. Uh, Steve Stone brought it up on the broadcast last night. And as the weather is now hot, of course, in April and May, it, it tends to be cold, 60 degrees, 50 degrees along those lines. Traditionally, the Sox offense doesn't heat up until June. Now we're in the middle of July, and you saw those bets come alive on Sunday night in that exhibition game against the Cubs. So I, I expect this offense to carry the Sox. Now, will it carry them to a hot start? We shall see. Yeah, I think like every what you said, Sid, I think Kopeck would have been more of a bullpen guy. But I think he would have added maybe like three to five wins for the White Sox. I still think they would have missed a playoff spot even if he had decided to play. So, but yeah, I mean, it would be a little bit different. Yeah, but I still don't think they would have made the playoffs if, if Kopech decided to opt in. Okay. All right. So since we're – okay, we'll, we'll do a little, a little NL real quick before – you know, we get to college. I know, JC, you got a lot to say about the college. Um, the National League, you got to think maybe Atlanta. You got to think they're, they're the favorite. You got to think the defending champion Nationals. The Dodgers, I mean, you got to think. I'm a little worried, though, because they've got 60 games. They, but I think they have a lot of motivation because, since, especially with everything that's happened with the, the cheating and whatnot for the, the last two minutes <laughs> in the wait, World wait, Series. Wait, so. in baseball? I, I forgot about that. Are you, are you <laughs> saying there are important things that happen? within the world of sports that somehow took away from this cheating scandal? What? Yeah. Crazy, right? <laughs> I know. Crazy, right, Jason? I mean, just seeing all this stuff started happening and everybody forgot about what the Astros did and what the Red Sox did. So, but on a serious note, I think, I think the Dodgers, you got to think they're, they're the favorite. I think the, I think the Cubs can definitely make some noise too. I know since there's a little, there's a little bit of a buzz about them, but I, I just don't think they're ready yet. Um, Milwaukee, we'll see where they are. St. Louis, I think they take a step back. Um, but I think it's really the Dodgers are the favorites in the National League, I think. What do you guys think? Oh, you know, this is my favorite team to talk about, Dodgers. So um, it's it's interesting that, you know, of course, they made a big splash uh, in acquiring Mookie Betts and David Price. Obviously, David Price has opted out of the season. He's not going to pitch. Um, they lost uh, – uh, forgive me, I'm probably butchering his name, but Hyun Jin Ryu, I think. I think I got that right. Um, (laughs) They lost him in free agency. Of course, he was the National League ERA leader last year, um, but they still got Kershaw. They still got a pretty good offense. But um, you you, you guys know how I feel about L.A. I mean, I I tend to sound like a broken record here. Uh, They they haven't gotten it done. So until they actually get it done, I I just don't believe in what they're doing at all. Um, Having said that, though, I'm I'm not sure if there's a team that can really challenge them in the NL West. Uh, we'll, We'll see what the Diamondbacks do. I mean, I know they acquired Madison Bumgarner, but I think he's on the other side of his prime at this point in his career. I'm not sure how much of a difference he'll make. Um, I think Colorado's good, but I, I, I'm just not completely sold on them. Um, and the Giants, I mean, obviously Buster Posey opted out of, of, uh, of, of the restart mm-hmm. as well. But again, he's on the other side of his prime too. So I'm not sure what the Giants can necessarily bring to the table. But I, I mean, I guess by default, you're going to have the LA Dodgers probably win the division. Um, so, you know, but again, they, they, they've got to actually win the championship for me to believe in it. Um, out East, obviously, you know, you've got an, an improved New York Mets squad. We talked about them a little bit earlier, Sydney. Um, mm-hmm. 
Uh, the Philadelphia Phillies, I got to believe they're going to be better just by default. Um, they, they had, they're a team that got off to such a bad start last year. Um, I think Andrew McCutcheon is going to be ready to go. I haven't heard too much about that. Um, I think Bryce Harper is going to be better, but I, I, I mean, I, you know, it, it, Bryce Harper for me is polarizing as well. Um, is he worth the money? Probably, but is he a, a, a guy that is a difference maker? I just still don't know, even at this point in Bryce Harper's career. Uh, but I think the Philadelphia Phillies are going to be good. Again, talk about the mess, the Atlanta Braves. They lost Josh Donaldson, but I think they're still going to be good. Um, and, 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 you know, we'll, we'll see as far as the NL Central goes as well. I mean, I, again, I like Cincinnati. I think they made a lot of, a lot of good moves. I like Eugenio Suarez as an MVP candidate in this shortened season. Uh, Sydney, I, I mean, he's killed the Cubs enough. So I, I think I'm going to jump on, on his bandwagon and think he's going to have another monster year. Um, I think Nick Castellanos is going to continue his sort of sort of second half from last year. I think he's going to continue that a little bit into this shortened season. He's a big bat in that lineup. Um, of course, they got Dr Trevor Bauer there. I, I like him in that rotation. I think the Cincinnati Reds are going to be good. And, of course, the Cardinals and the Milwaukee Brewers, it's going to be a really, really tough NL Central. So as far as my predictions for the National League, I think the Dodgers are a slam dunk to win the NL West. As far as playoffs, I'm not sure. One thing personally that I'm looking at is Mookie Betts. He's going into a free agent year, so I'm glad he's getting a chance to play and to show what he has in a Dodgers uniform, even though it's going to be a 60-game season. I know people want to say that the San Diego Padres may take a next step. Maybe they will, but that I don't, I don't see it this year as far as playoffs are concerned. So... I think that the Dodgers, you could uh, sure them for an NL West title. Now, in the Central, I'm with you on Cincinnati. Will they take the division? I'm not sure, but this is the year to do it because it's a 60-game sprint. The Cubs, they just – they have too many holes for me. They still have a dangerous lineup, but I know it was an exhibition game last night, but if Cal Hendricks, who was your opening day starter against Milwaukee coming up this week on Friday, if Cal Hendricks looks like that – you're going to have problems. You still have Lester there. I know he struggled a, a bit some cards during the second half the last couple of years. So I'm really questioning that pitching staff overall for the Chicago Cubs, especially their, bull, their bullpen. But uh, I'm not sure about Pittsburgh, uh, Milwaukee. Uh, I don't know about them either, but I think it's going to be Cincinnati, the Cubs third, and St. Louis. St. Louis always hangs around. They have a bunch of no-name guys, unless you watch baseball, but they always find a way to get it done somehow. In the NL East, uh, uh, Washington, they're their favorite because they're the defending world champs, but uh, the Mets can uh, uh, score, uh, scare some people. I like Atlanta, but Philadelphia, I'm not sure they're there yet, but they, they do have the right manager in Georgia Wright. He'll get those guys ready ready to play. He'll, he'll keep their focus uh, on the field. It'd be very interesting because, like, like, like I've been saying, you know, I know I've been beating this this point to death, but I think it's going to depend on who has the hot start. If you have a hot start, I think it's going to mm -hmm. be hard to catch up to that team. If you have a bad start, you can just forget it. So that's going to be the key, like who has a good start and which teams have a have a bad start. And if it's going to be hard to bounce back since you only have sixty games, but we'll see. I mean, it should be interesting. All right, so we got these last few minutes. Uh, the college aspect of it, it's starting to kind of – still a lot of stuff going on, a little, still a lot of, like, you know, everything's kind of up in the air, if you will. We know the Big Ten, the Pac-12, they've already said that they're going to do conference only. Um, the SEC hasn't said it yet, but I think they probably will. They will maybe have to make some adjustments. Some of the smaller schools, I think the MEAC, we just talked about it on Friday, said the MEAC has mm -hmm. said that they're canceling all their fall sports while some, I think, I'm trying to think of this on the other conference. I think there were a couple of conferences that said they're going to, you know, just Ivy postpone. Go, go ahead, Jason. No, I was just going to say the Ivy League as well. Yeah, Ivy League. And also I think a couple other con small conferences have kind of postponed all their stuff till till the spring. So, Jason, I know you have a, since you have a chance to really talk about it. Well, I'll start with you. What, what do you think about all this has been going on among the college ranks? Yeah, um, it's it's unfortunate. You know, I I don't think we're surprised um, that that these conferences are following, um, you know, each other as far as only playing conference games. But some of these other the lower conferences, I, I feel bad for because they're probably going to have to uh, cancel their fall sports. And even some of the D1 schools as well, like Stanford, they're they're having to outright cancel some of their programs uh, 
uh, because of this pandemic. So those, those are, you know, those student athletes are the ones I really uh, I feel bad for. Um, uh, here locally, I, I know I, I work with um, the Horizon League. They're not even thinking about getting play started until after October. So I know that affects their fall sports a little bit. And uh, again, you know, it's, it's, it's the seniors, you know, uh, especially from the end of last year that didn't get a chance to possibly make an NCAA tournament or, you know, um, couldn't, couldn't take part in the, in the playoffs or anything like that, or, mm -hmm. or you know, sort of, um, you know, second season for, for those outgoing seniors. Those are the ones, uh, seniors, those are the ones I feel bad for. Um, but I think it's necessary. You know, um, I agree with you, Lakina. I think the SEC is going to have to reluctantly follow suit with the Big Ten and Pac-12 and only play conference games. I know that eliminates a few um, uh, high-profile and marquee matchups, uh, you know, that, that usually happen right around the start of the season. Some of those, those interconference uh, games that we, all, that we all look forward to that can, you know, make or break a season for some of these college teams. I know we're going to miss that a little bit. But uh, again, it's at the end of the day, we ha there has to be a proactive nature in, in being safe uh, for these kids and for these coaches and for the, the, the staff. And, you know, do we like it? No, of course not. But I think it's necessary. And um, we're going to have college sports in some capacity, but it, obviously it's going to be different. As you mentioned, Jason, safety is the number one key for all these sports returning both college and pro. And for college football, I think it's safe to say, if I had to predict right now, we all know that the, uh, the date is still on for August 29th for college football to kick off. If I had to make a prediction right now, I think it will be a delay a couple of weeks, especially as you guys mentioned the Big Ten and the Pac-12 going to conference-only schedules. And like you said, Lakina, we talked about this on our last podcast. The commissioner of the, of the SEC, of course, a couple of months ago, he said, we're going to play football no matter what. Come hell or high water, we're going to play football no matter what. He changed his two over the last month because in, uh, in the SEC, uh, in, in many of those states, uh, the coronavirus cases have risen. So he had to change his two a little bit. So he, he's like, oh, I don't know. We're going to start on time. I, I don't know yet. So, But uh, as you mentioned, Jason, uh, the SEC will probably end up following suit to have only a conference uh, exclusive schedule. And uh, we all know that at the end of the day, that money is on the line here. So and as far as attendance is concerned, uh, you're going to see 20 to 30% capacity at these games, including in SEC country, because they don't want to lose out on that, on that money. So I think you'll see that, that formula going on this season. You'll see college football this year. Let's, uh, heaven forbid that the words come the the words uh, come the words as far as the coronavirus uh, cases are concerned. But I think you will see some form of college football this year. I just I just don't think they'll they'll start on time. And if you look at the uh, the crowd aspect of it, like you know, said we talked about in the last podcast on Friday that Illinois, you know, they're not going to have any tailgating. They're going to only mm -hmm. have like twenty percent. 20% capacity down there at their stadium for their football. Um, you're not, look, we've been saying this for like the last few weeks. I mean, 8,000, 90,000 over the big house, like a, over a hundred thousand. You're not going to see that all, all those folks there. You may see maybe 20, maybe 30% at most of some of these stadiums because they got to recoup that money somehow. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think, look, we've been saying this for, for months. How come there is no like czar for college football? There have been Mac, Mac Brown was talking about it, uh, you know, the who's head coach of North Carolina, he was talking about it uh, in one of the national shows. He said, Look, how come there's no like organization from some from someone in LA to say, Okay, look, this is what you do, blah, 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 this is this and that, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that, that these conferences are have been kind of on their own just shows you that how out of touch the NCAA is and out of, out of step the NCAA is and like I can go on, you know, about this double A for like, so, but we don't have the time. So Jason, <laughs> Jason, you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just a couple of quick things I wanted to touch on. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's the NFL and the NCAA. They have been uh, hilariously slow and reactive instead of proactive as far as implementing mandates and guidelines uh, to, to make these players and coaches feel safe. Um, they, there's have been little to no action. And like you said, Lakina, they've, <laughs> they've been left to basically try to figure things out on their own as far as the conferences go, the Power Five conferences go. Uh, Mark Emmert, we, we know 
and, and listen, I won't I won't use the colorful words, but we we know <laughs> as far as as being the head of the NCAA, and and again how they are noticeably hands off when it comes to important topics, especially uh, in this day and age. So um, I, I I just I, it's not surprising that they're that they're being slow on this type of thing, and when it comes to uh, the, 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 the crowd capacity. And I don't know if you guys feel me on this, but it's something that I thought about and I, I think it matters. Um, like you said, you mentioned the big house, over a hundred thousand, uh, uh, fans, uh, the, the, the horseshoe in Columbus, over a hundred thousand fans, right? The, mm-hmm. I think the crowd capacity matters in a lot of these cases. You're talking about both death valleys, uh, in Clemson and, and, and at LSU, uh, yeah. Bryant Denny stadium in Alabama, right? Um, I, I can't remember the name of the stadium, but the stadium in Auburn, right? I mean, these yep. these are our, our iconic venues. Jordan Air, Jordan Air Stadium. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, and and I, I think it matters as, as far as, you know, crowd participation and, and home field, home court advantage, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think it could play a factor as well in this upcoming season. I know it may not seem as serious to some, but I think it does. Did. Yeah, especially, yeah, especially college uh, college sports. Fear about uh, talking about college football. Uh, the, the the crowd matters uh, to these young players because they they feed off the energy, they feed off the passion of the fans. As we talked about Lakina La before, these last few weeks, uh, college sports is like the NFL. They're presented in a television style form. They present it as a TV show. Uh, what do we see at, uh, when when the telecast comes on as, as they announce which two teams are playing? They get a shout at the stadium. They get a shout at the crowd, the cheerleaders, before they go to the announcers, eventually to the action on the field. So college football will, will be different if they have no fans in the stands. But as we said before, they have the stadium filled up to 20 to 30% capacity. you rather see that than no fans at all. Yes, I think that's what we're going to probably end up seeing. And it'll be interesting to see how if this affects college college hoops because I don't know who I don't know who was it that said it, but I don't know if it was Coach Cal or was it Anthony Grant. So, somebody said that they wouldn't be surprised if they delayed the college hoop season. I, I, I forgot who it was. One of the top coaches. I forgot who said it, but I think it was Greg Pitino. He said uh, they, they should start college basketball in January with conference yeah. only. I read yeah. that somewhere about a, a week or so ago. Yeah. So I. Don't be surprised if we see if we see that because this could look with everything being pushed back. I mean, especially with college football, if if some of these schools and some of these conferences decide to do forego the college football season this springtime, if you're a top draft pick, if you're a potential top draft pick, what do you do? Because that's just going up against like NFL like workouts and stuff. What do you guys think about that? I think you just set it out because if let's just say college football gets uh, put on hold for the fall and they don't resume to the spring. If you're Trevor Lawrence or some of these top uh, other prospects, you're going to treat it like a ball game. It's just like a whole season. You just set it out because, let's be honest here, the NFL is not going to change the date of their draft. They're going to push it back to the summertime right before training camp of the following season. That's not going to happen. So if you're Trevor Lawrence or some of these other top prospects, you you have to protect yourself anyway, right? So just sit, sit out the season. If it, start, it prolongs the start to the spring, just set it out. Jason? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree. I agree because um, if you're a high-profile player, you just don't want to risk it. You know, you just don't want to do it, and it's, it's too much money involved. Um, you know, not and, and risk involved, not only for yourself but for the team that could potentially be drafting you. So yeah, I'm I'm just in full agreement. Sit it out if if it's even being thought of or being pushed back at all. Yeah, like I said, it's gonna be look. College football is gonna look very different this year, and pumping in the crowd noise, if you will. If there are no fans in the stands, I mean. This is uncharted territory, and it'll be interesting to see. We'll see what the SEC does, and I think, like you guys said, they may they may not have a choice. I know they don't want to do it, but they may not have a choice but to do all conference. And look, look, right. look like like I've been saying, the Big Twelve is like, look, we've been doing this for like the past decade. <laughs> so, look, we're we're doing we're doing just fine. Look, y'all just doing what we've been doing. So we got like ten teams. You know, we get ten games. If it's just ten games, okay, fine. We still get to play Texas, Oklahoma, even though there's not going to be a, a fair this year, but. Look, we're good. <laughs> All right, these last few minutes. So, uh, anything else that's on your mind, Jason? Oh, no, go ahead, Sid. What what'd you say, Sid? Ask you guys this question. I heard this on. Go, go, go ahead, go ahead, Jason. Because 
Dame's okay, I, uh, I was on the national show over the weekend. We all know that Notre Dame is not part of her, her conference. Yeah, uh, Notre Dame is not part of her conference uh, when, it's, when it comes to football. Uh, do you think uh, if they go to this conference-only schedule, will they join the ACC or will they join? Oh, okay. So go. Go, go ahead and uh, share your thoughts, yeah, because sometimes his, his, his Wi-Fi gets a little iffy. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, uh, Jason. <laughs> No, yeah, no, that's okay. I, well, I think um, if I got the gist of your question there, Sid, um, you're, you're asking if Notre Dame will join the, the ACC uh, conference. Um, I, I mean, I think they should have been doing that in the first place. Listen, I, it's been my opinion about Notre Dame. They've been way too arrogant about being an independent, um, especially when it comes to college football. I mean, they're basically – well, they are an ACC team uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to college basketball, so they should mm -hmm. pretty much be that – Anyway, um, I know there have been some talks. I, I think I read a report uh, maybe a week or two ago that they were in talks with the ACC conference um, about maybe working something possibly out. But, yeah, I mean, I think they, they play seven ACC teams, I think, a year anyway. So mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 it wouldn't be surprising to me if they, you know, make their schedule with ACC, all ACC opponents at all. It's a logical – it's a logical – Logical choice, right? I mean, they're in a the ACC for every other sport, you know, other than football. So you might as well just, you know, they might as well go ahead. Like you, like I said, uh, Jace, they they play six or seven ACC teams a year, so you might as well go full on and just add a couple of uh, teams and on your schedule. And you know, we'll, we'll we'll see how they measure up to the ACC in football. We'll just say. And also, BYU is an interesting spot too, because they're also an independent. Do they go back to? Because the West Coast Conference, they don't have football. So do they go back to the Mountain West where they were for football? We'll see. All right. Yeah, all right. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's going to be interesting with these smaller schools as we talked about the last couple of weeks with Keenan. Would they keep football or not? We saw a couple of small conferences uh, canceling the fall sports. Uh, wherever the big conferences do, the small schools will follow. Anything else on your mind, Jason? We got a few more minutes. Um, no, not really. Um, I think, I think you mentioned this right at the top of the show, but shout out to John Rahm winning the Memorial, uh, over the weekend. Um, I think he's no number one in the world, yep. I believe. Uh, so yeah, congratulations to him. Um, you know, uh, golf was one of the first sports to kind of come back, uh, in a, in a somewhat full capacity. So I've been watching a lot of that. Um, we'll get into this on another show, but I, at some point I want to get you guys' thoughts on the last dance. I know you guys have talked about it already. Um, we don't have time to get into it right now. Only a few minutes left, but um, you know, that, that was, that was certainly a, a big part of uh, relieving some of my fix uh, of, of not having basketball and sports and, and something to talk about in, in general. But um, again, as we get these restarts, um, you know, started back up within the next few days, we'll, We'll bring all the upcoming news and notes right here for you on Second City. And uh, again, I'm I'm back. I'm glad to join you guys once again. I missed you, and um and then we'll you know hopefully we'll be back on this thing on a regular basis. Yeah, we missed you too, Jason. Glad to have you back, and hopefully we'll have you on a regular schedule. I know we will. So uh, it's good to have the band back together again. So uh, we miss you. You do a great job. You're going to continue to do a great job for us. And as our listeners know, we'll have two of the two episodes uh, hopefully per week from, from the crew here and we'll continue to bring you great guests to provide us with great analysis and great thoughts on on the athletes and teams that you love to watch so uh, anything else for you guys before we call it a day uh, no no I'm good um, unfortunately the fire lost last night so you know they kind of kind of got back to kind of <laughs> fell back to earth a little bit they lost to one of the top teams in the MLS but you know, look, they they still they can still you know kind of write things there. Hopefully, they can kind of advance the playoffs of this whole thing. But uh, yeah, other than that, and you know, John Rahm, I think listen, deserve really so. I mean, he's been one of the rising stars in the PGA. You know, coming from Spain, you know, he did he did well over Europe in the European Tour. He's doing well here, and yeah, listen, it's gonna be very interesting. You know, well, Tiger Tiger was kind of up and down. You know, those that back was still mm -hmm. giving him problems. So. We'll see, especially you got, you know, the, um, not, there's no, there's no U.S. Open or Open Championship this year. So 
it'll be a, well, well, I think the U.S. Open is starting late, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Tiger because that's something to look out. That's something to watch out for because that back is still giving him some problems. All right, on on that. Go no go. What's that, guys? No, no, no. I'm good. Like I said, I'm just sort of ready for these restarts, and um, I think there's another exhibition game tonight between the Cubs and Sox, I believe. So we're we'll trying yeah. to tune into that. Um, unfortunately, it won't be on the Marquee Network, and I, I don't got, got time to get into that either. But um, <laughs> we'll get into that next week with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, we will. All right. Now, on that no, you can follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter at Keena underscore McGee on the Insta. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at SidKid80. Once again, that's SidKid80, S-I-D-K-I-D-80. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-80. You can read all of my articles at weareregalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L radio.com. And you can follow the Dean Davis Show, which is the crew that I'm a part of, of all of our social media uh, platforms. It's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dean Davis Show. Once again, at Dean Davis Show. And you can listen to this fine uh, program Second City Sports, along with our other programs, part of the We Are Regal Radio podcast network. You can listen to us at War on Anchor, which keeps you over the Spotify. Uh, listen to all of our great programs uh, on your uh, podcast platform. So check us out there. And you can follow me at Truth and Reason underscore on the Twitter. I am going to start ramping back up the show's Twitter handle once again within the next few days. Here it is at Two N D. C-S-C-H-I. Follow us, we follow back. Uh, you can also listen to and or watch the go route that I do with our good friend Derek Tate, part of the Fantasy Focused crew. Uh, we just posted a new episode yesterday, and we'll have another new episode for you this upcoming weekend. Uh, talk about a lot of good stuff. Obviously, with the NFL's lack of action with protocols and mandates and, and the possibility of a shortened season, it's going to be interesting to watch. So, Stay tuned for that. And again, I'm glad to be back on Second City Sports here. So stay tuned. All right. So great show. Also, we all want to thank James Fox. Uh, yeah, where is he from, Sid? Uh, futuresocks.com. Futuresocks.com. All you Sox fans, or even, even non white Sox fans, you guys should check that out. Also, our, our buddy Mark Grody. You can follow him, Mark Grody Sports, on Twitter. You can listen to him on 670 Discord. Also, remember, let me put a list together. You know, it's a great podcast, so make sure you download that podcast as well. He does it with his good buddy, Brian Mitchell. He, he used to do, you know, voiceover radio here. He's up in Minnesota now doing the same thing. But, uh, yeah, so great to have the, 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 the gang back together again. Yay. So for Jason and Sid, I'm Lakina. This has been Second State Sports Zoom style, and we'll see you on Friday. Wear your mask. Holla. And wash your hands. <laughs>